Okay, in this video I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on vector calculus for electromagnetism. This is video number 39 and I'm going to discuss the Helmholtz theorem. I'd like to draw your attention to my website universityphysicstories.com. So I'm going to talk about the Helmholtz theorem and I'm going to talk about it without a proof. This theorem is vital for your electromagnetism. Without this you cannot study electromagnetism, full stop. Because electromagnetism talks about scalar and vector potentials or we might know the scalar potential for the electric field is called the, the voltage, we'll say. So we cannot, we cannot talk about these unless we talk about the Helmholtz theorem. So I'm just going to talk about the, um, I'm going to talk about the results of the theorem rather than the theorem itself. If you want, you can perhaps look up a proof somewhere. But for the moment, we'll just accept that it is correct. So what do we know? Well, we know that a vector field is determined by its divergence and its curl. But the question that is posed by the Hel oh, to the Helmholtz theorem, I suppose, really is by what amount is your vector field determined by your curl and your divergence? So if you know, what if you know, if you have a field, for example, not A, because I've, I've since changed that, you'll have to excuse me. What if I have a field R, a random field R, and you know both this divergence and curl? Okay, like I've written here. What happens? What happens if you know it's both, both your, your field's divergence and curl? What actually do you know about your field? So, I'm just going to push this up and discuss it. Okay, so if we have a random field, which I'm going to call the vector R, and you know it's divergence and curl. So let's say we take the divergence of our vector field and we get a scalar. I'm going to call the scalar D. And we get the uh, the the uh, curl of our vector field and I'm going to call it the vector C. Notice by the way it's important that we're getting a scalar D but the vector C. Now for completeness we know that the gradient of the curl, or excuse me, the divergence of the curl is zero. Look at video number 27 for that. So that means that the, uh, the divergence of C must be zero in order for it to have us to have consistency. Now there are lots of functions we, or there aren't lots of functions, but there, there are functions where we can find both the divergence of R and the curl of R by, by, by having both of them zero. But if we find that, we don't know anything about our field. So, you know, other than using zero as, our, as our, um, the result of our divergence and curl, what, what can we find out? How, how can we find out what our vector field is? Well, we're solving differential equations because each of these is, is, a, is a differential equation. So you should know by so that in order to solve a differential equation, you need your appropriate boundary conditions. So we need to set our boundary conditions. And for that reason, I'm going to tell you the boundary conditions for electromagnetism before we've began studying electromagnetism, if you're following the course as I am laying it out. Maybe you've seen this already. The boundary condi conditions for electromagnetism are as follows. That the fields will go to zero as you go far away from the sources. So let's say you're talking about the electric field. The source of the electric field is electric charge. Let's say the, the electron. Uh, sorry, that's, that's the source. So if you go far away from the electron, your field will go to zero. And it is in that realm that the Helmholtz theorem holds true. So that is the boundary condition which we're going to apply on the fields which uh, we use the Helmholtz theorem in. And I'm going to tell you that we use the Helmholtz theorem for both the electric and the magnetic fields. So what does it tell you? And I, like, what, are, what is the result of the Helmholtz theorem? Well, if we come up with a, uh, if we come up with um, conditions, we can we can describe things called potentials. Now I'm not going to discuss why we call them potentials. Perhaps you'll know now, or maybe you'll see it later on. So there are two things we can do. We can look at the curl and the divergence, and let's say if one of them vanishes. So let's say, for example that the curl of our vector field R is zero everywhere. So for some reason the curl is zero but the divergence is not. Okay, that's very important. If the divergence, excuse me, if the curl is zero everywhere, then what we can do is we can rewrite our vector field as minus the gradient of a scalar. Now this is a scalar. Okay, and notice both together of course it becomes a vector. So the gradient is a vector, but v is a scalar on its own. Okay, so you may you may know that later on we're going to be calling this vector r uh, the electric field, and that's where we get our voltage. But that's beside the point. Now, where do we get this minus sign? That is convention. 
don't worry about it, it's just convention. That we could easily have named it, we could easily have defined it as plus the gradient of the potential, but we don't. So we call this V, this scalar, the scalar potential. Okay? So uh, any field which satisfies this equation obviously has no curl, so we call it an irrotational or a curlless field. So if the field is curlless or irrotational, there are a couple of other things, other uh, equations which are which are um, equivalent. For example, if you take the closed line integral of, we'll say, r dot dl, that's going to be zero. Okay. Or if you take the integral from a to b of r dot dl, and it's independent, it's path independent. Okay. And what's the, the final one is the curl is zero. So the curl is zero everywhere. The closed line, it, it's independent. Okay, and also we'll say R is equal to minus the gradient of some scalar. So all of these are equivalent terms. They're all equivalent. So if your field ma matches any one of those, uh, it's, it's said to be curlless or irrotational. But more often than not, what we do is we see if our field sat satisfies one of these and we use this particular formation or formula and we talk about the scalar potential of our vector field. So this is a curlless or irrotational field. Now what happens if it's, um, what happens if we do satisfy this curlless or irrotational field where our vector r is equal to minus the gradient of our scalar function v? Now the thing about this is it's not actually uni uniquely defined because we can add a constant to v and it's still the same. For example, it would be the same vector field if we got minus the gradient of v plus, say, a constant. Because if you take the derivative of a constant, you get, you get back zero. So it, it's actually not always uniquely defined just by this. And we're able to add and subtract constants with impunity and not change the actual field itself. And that's actually what we do. With, that's why the potential formulation is so great. And we use this in, uh, in electromagnetism. We talk about gauges. And gauges our base a gauge is looking at a different value for this constant. So if you add a different value, you talk about a different gauge, and you're able to just it's just an easy way of or better way of evaluating your your potential. Now let's say if we have a divergentless a divergenceless field, okay, or the divergence is zero. So we take the divergence of our field, and it is equal to r. What the Helmholtz theorem says, if that is the case, and of course the curl is non-zero this time then what we get is we can, we can re-express our field as the curl of some vector potential. And it's very important that A is a vector potential. Okay, so it's more complicated, of course, because this has three different components, and it's not just the, the gradient, excuse me, it's not just the scalar. But it does simplify problems later on when we talk about magnetodynamic, or, mag, or excuse me, electrodynamics. So, Another, we'll say, the equivalent terms to this are as follows. You could say that the closed, we'll say, um, I'm going to move this, because we know at this stage it's a vector potential. If you took the closed, uh, the closed integral of r dot dA, and that's equal to zero everywhere, that's an equivalent, that's an equivalent statement. Or if the line integral of r dot dA is independent of surface, say independent of surface, that's an equivalent statement. Okay, or um, another one you could say, of course, is that the that the divergence of your field is equal to zero. They are all equivalent. Now, what we usually do is we look for this this statement, or perhaps this statement, or perhaps this statement, in order to use the first statement. So we try and express our function as the curl of a vector potential, and the vector potential is a. And now, so while this We'll say the two of those we spoke about a curlless or irrotational field, so we had with the, the curl of a vector was uh, was zero, and then we spoke about a divergenceless field where this was equal to zero, right? Then we could we could talk about r is equal to minus the gradient of a scalar, and r is equal to uh, that's yeah r is equal to the uh, the curl of a vector. But for you can generalize this, and the Helmholtz theorem says you can generalize this and say, in general, for all fields, R is minus the gradient of a scalar plus the gradient of a vector. So what we say is, 
this is you can write every single field every single um, vector field in this formula okay so just to skip ahead what we'll say is we'll, we'll talk about the, the the fields and we'll say this will be the the electric potential and this will be the magnetic potential and that's how we'll be able to talk about our electromagnetic field so or will be our electromagnetic field we we'll use our magnetic vector potential and our electric scalar potential okay just by the way to note that uh, the vector potential is also not unique because the gradient of any scalar function can be added to to your function or without changing it since the curl of the gradient is zero so it's similar to this one we said we could add constants here what we, we can do is we can we can um, we can add the gradient of a scalar to it no problem and uh, that won't change it but it allows us to talk about different gauges so that's all I've got to say about that. The Helmholtz theorem is very important and we'll be talking about curless and irrita curless irrotational fields and divergenceless fields all the time. So thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends, subscribe to my channel, and you might also click on universityphysicstorials.com.